I am honoured to have been asked to deliver the annual Sacro Lecture, which is held in continuing tribute to the late Professor Derek McClintock, one of the pioneers in the field of criminology in the United Kingdom, as well as the first chair of criminology at this university. Coincidentally, tomorrow night sees the annual Drummond Hunter Lecture in, uh, held by the Howard League in Scotland in honour of the man who was the Howard League in Scotland uh, for many years and who was a pioneer of penal reform and an abolitionist, even though the tide was moving for many years in the uh, opposite direction. At the Drummond Hunter Lecture, I only ever introduce our chair, uh, who then introduces the speaker. But there is a personal element, because Drummond was a member of the committee of the Howard League when I joined it in the 1990s. Sadly, I did not ever meet or hear Derek McClintock, and so I'm not in the same position as at least one person who's given this uh, talk in, in recent years who had actually been taught by him. This forced me to do some homework on the man, and it threw up a nice coincidence, especially given the subject that I had chosen. Many of you may know this, but there is a collection of essays dedicated to Derek McClintock entitled Support for Crime Victims in a Comparative Perspective. It was published in 1998, four years after his death. It provides a great insight into the man uh, and his work, but perhaps even better for my purposes, the book starts with the text of his talk in 1993, which was entitled Victims and Criminal Justice. Uh, and this sets the scene for the contributions that follow in the book. Those that knew him pay tribute in the book to his pioneering work in the field of what was then called victimology. Better still for tonight was the fact that the talk was delivered to the Howard League for penal reform in Scotland, albeit it must have been just before my uh, time. I'm fairly sure, and I see Bruce Richardson's here, so he may be able to confirm that Drummond would have been present at the talk, and I can picture these two great forward thinkers, Derek McClintock and Drummond Hunter, exchanging ideas and putting the justice system to rights. Uh, what a system we would have if the two of them had been in charge of it. And so I like to think that there is some symmetry in this talk being delivered tonight by the present convener of the Howard League, which benefited from Derek's wisdom over 20 years ago. I think that Derek would have welcomed the topic chosen in his honour this year as he was ahead of his time in consideration of uh, victims of crime. One further and final coincidence is that the speaker tomorrow night for the Drummond Hunter Lecture is the Lord Justice Clark, Lord Carloway, who is also here tonight and who last year gave this lecture. Uh, I believe that he may develop some of the themes that he outlined to this audience then, and so I hope that many of you can attend uh, tomorrow night back here uh, as well. But now I need to move on from coincidences to caveats. I have to offer a number of these at the outset. Our criminal justice process is the subject of much discussion and debate. It features on a daily basis in our press and other media. Discussions often proceed on the basis of truncated facts and sweeping assumptions, or at the very least generalities which fail to reflect all the many nuances which exist in actual cases. Speaking in generalities, saves time and effort, of course. It seems to be thought by some editors, wrongly to my mind, that great detail might deter readers or viewers. Thus, in certain newspapers, all acquittals are described as Mr. X walking free, all crimes are serious, all victims demand retribution, and indeed, speaking on our behalf freely and without consultation, they tell us that society wants to lock them up and throw away the key. I regret, as I'm sure many here do, the primary colour depiction of a system of infinite shades, variations and subtleties, but it often seems that we are offered little choice. I do accept from this criticism Alan Robertson of Holyrood Magazine, who I think may be here tonight, um, and usually the Herald newspaper. Tonight I may speak in general terms due to time restrictions, but please do not think 
that I regard restorative justice or restorative processes as a panacea for all ills. By restorative justice, I mean those processes which have the aim and effect of repairing the harm done to people by crime and the healing of relationships brought about by the parties in a conflict working together to resolve the issues. Restorative justice encounters can benefit victims, can empower communities, and can change the attitudes of offenders. For perhaps obvious reasons, restorative justice will never be compulsory, whether for offender or victim. And that still seems to be one of the uh, hurdles that it has to overcome. It will not work for everyone, but then neither does any current process. While we seem prepared to give infinite chances to imprisonment to demonstrate that it can work, and while Scotland may be the home of criminal justice pilots, sadly it seems to me that restorative justice is one area where we are too timid, too averse to considering the positive outcomes here and elsewhere, and too tied to what we have always done. As a consequence, we are not really in control of what our justice system or process is doing. For example, does anyone here really think that 7,731 people in Scotland need to be in prison today, with around 17% of them on remand? Because I've not met anyone who, who actually thinks that. The Prison Commission reminded us, and there are prison commission members here, uh, of what we already knew, and yet the population, prison population has risen in the last six years, albeit there have been signs of slowing and some other positive uh, indications. And it has risen because of decisions rather than by mere accident, um, which means that we are actually in charge of its increasingly unwieldy dimensions, albeit there is often a shrug of the shoulders and defeated acceptance of this as inevitable. But despite austerity, when money is needed to build prisons, it is found with an extra 1.5, with, sorry, with an extra 15 million pounds being found for HM Prison Inverclyde in a period of just about 18 months. While I recognize the considerable good work being funded in the community by the government and others, and also that it is not simply a question of funding, there is still a primacy given to prison in our system and a failure to find appropriate funding to the same extent outside prison walls. My main support for restorative justice comes not from financial considerations, but even in the United States, there is support for moves away from the use of imprisonment as the answer to all criminal justice questions. And this is to some extent because of increasing realization of the waste of money involved. Justice reinvestment is one of the new buzz phrases as they start to try to reverse the insanity of their penal policy. I mention this because restorative justice is much cheaper than prison too. So for those making decisions based on budgetary considerations, it is well worth a look. Before I say a little about restorative practices, I want to say a little about that apparently crowded place, the heart of the criminal justice system. I think it has always been recognized that the accused is at the heart of the system. But in recent years, there have been increasing demands from some and apparent acceptance by government ministers that the heart of the system should be expanded so that it can be occupied by victims along with the accused, or sometimes even by victims on their own. Legislation has sometimes been offered as a means of securing this relocation of key participants. Now, it may just be me, but whatever the good intentions, it seems that the heart of the system has not changed. For my part, I doubt that it ever will, the heart of this system. What is described as placing victims at the heart of the system translates into treating them with greater respect and providing greater information about the process and its outcomes. No one can argue against such basic courtesies. Remembering how things were when I first started to practice in the courts about 28 years ago, it was absolutely essential that greater respect be afforded to victims and witnesses. Information is key to ensuring that they feel that they are properly respected and involved to a greater extent consistent with their wishes. The problem with the rhetoric around such basic steps is the claim that it involves relocation of victims to the center of the system. This is essentially meaningless 
The criminal process is involved in trying to determine whether guilt has been proved. Obviously, guilt is accepted by accused persons, by offenders, more often than it requires to be established by way of a trial. Thereafter, the process involves trying to identify the appropriate disposal of the case and of the offender. The state has taken the conflict from the victim, or stolen it, as some would have it. Victims in our system are largely dispossessed and sidelined, even if treated with respect and provided with information. So to those whose rhetoric raises unachievable expectations about victims having a central role in our current system, can I suggest that they look instead at restorative justice as a means of giving genuine effect to such claims of significant rearrangement of the geography of the system so as to allow a truly central role for both victim and offender. Turning firstly to the involvement of the offender in restorative justice, it might be thought that there is no way in to an appropriate conversation with an accused person so as to open up the possibility of a restorative process. I disagree. Experience elsewhere shows that it can be done. It may be a tricky conversation, but it, it can it be done and can be successful. Even here, as part of my job, my day job, I have to tell accused persons that they may be entitled to a discount in sentence if they plead guilty at an early stage. That is what advice is given to the innocent as well as to the guilty. There is no evidence that this advice results in pleas of guilty from the innocent. And in the same way, an innocent person is unlikely to want to participate or to be able to participate in a restorative process which is likely to require discussion, explanation, and apology for admitted behavior. Next, I consider the human rights dimension. In advanced publicity, I perhaps boldly offer the human rights analysis of restorative justice for victims and offenders. In fact, the area has been the subject of specific provision internationally at United Nations, Council of Europe, and European Union level. A 1999 recommendation from the Council of Europe's Committee of Ministers uh, addressed the, the topic. It said, noting the developments in member states and the use of mediation in penal matters as a flexible, comprehensive, problem-solving, participatory, option complementary, or alternative to traditional uh, criminal proceedings with mediation uh, being used uh, as an alternative to restorative justice. Considering the need to enhance active personal participation in criminal proceedings of the victim and the offender and others who may be affected as parties as well as the involvement of the community. Recognizing the legitimate interest of victims to have a stronger voice in dealing with the consequences of their victimization to communicate with the offender and to obtain apology and reparation. Considering the importance of encouraging offenders' sense of responsibility and offering them practical opportunities to make amends which may further their reintegration and rehabilitation. Recognizing that mediation may increase awareness of the important role of the individual and the community in preventing and handling crime and resolving its associated conflicts. Thus encouraging more constructive and less repressive criminal justice outcomes. And that was really just the preamble uh, to the recommendation. It is made clear that the free consent of both parties to participation is an essential. It's a general principle there. Uh, it's something that has been stated in all of the international documents. Um, and it was stated in the attempt to amend the Victims and Witnesses Act as well. It deals with uh, issues such as the availability of restorative justice, the training of those who provide it, time limits for, for making sure that things are moved along uh, quickly enough to be meaningful, confidentiality, the, the fact that matters arising in restorative justice or in mediation can't be used in any subsequent proceedings. Victim safety is obviously a key part. The need for research is pointed up in much of this material as well. There are particular provisions, as you would expect, in relation to young offenders and to children. There is, in fact, international guidance on every aspect of restorative justice, including 
the, the matters that I've just mentioned. There's a United Nations resolution from 2002, basic principles on the use of restorative justice programs in criminal matters. There's a UN handbook from 2006 on restorative justice programs. There is a wealth of material uh, available, uh, freely available on the internet, including on websites uh, held by organizations who are here today, and I'm grateful to, to those for uh, assisting me in, in getting to, to grips with this uh, tricky area. From the European Union, there is the 2012 Victims Directive, establishing minimum standards on the rights, support, and protection of victims of crime, which replaced a 2001 framework decision. It was the 2012 Directive that led to the Victims and Witnesses Act, or, or at least contributed significantly to that, uh, which made it all the more odd that despite the fact that restorative justice is explicitly mentioned in the directive, in early stages of the legislation there was no mention of restorative justice at all, nor in the consultation leading to the, uh, the legislation. Um, so that did seem odd, uh, a, a stark and obvious omission. There is a Scottish working group on restorative justice, and uh, Mary Munro uh, contributed to my understanding of the, this uh, field. And this, uh, she was involved in that. The Scottish working group proposed that the absence of any mention of restorative justice be remedied. And so, uh, with the assistance of Alison McInnes, uh, an amendment was suggested that really incorporated uh, what the international standards said in this area, it, it didn't appear uh, to many of us to be terribly controversial. Um, and the Justice Committee at stage two of the bill agreed to the amendment that would have placed a duty on ministers to make provision uh, by regulations for the referral of victims and offenders or alleged offenders to restorative justice processes. Um, at debate, there was a, a compromise position which was ultimately settled upon uh, and rather than this duty in its place, there was uh, imposed, if that's the, the right word, uh, an ability to issue guidance relating to the referral of individuals to and the provision of restorative justice services. And the Cabinet Secretary for Justice said, I agree that more consideration should be given to the potential benefits of restorative justice to victims. And he also said, there are compelling reasons for adopting a more flexible approach than would be possible through a statutory scheme, statutory scheme, not least the importance of protecting both persons harmed and persons responsible from being drawn into restorative processes to which one or both parties are not fully committed. Now, for my part, I can't really see how the amendment that was originally proposed would have offended against these uh, apparent objections. And the statutory scheme was not terribly prescriptive, um, but Nonetheless, what we ended up with was the diluted section. And whether it's been diluted in practice obviously remains to be seen. In practice, with the right will, it could be just as effective as the original version. Otherwise, because it's an extremely permissive measure rather than a mandatory measure, it could just lie there as another reminder of missed opportunities in this field. In short, there is no doubt that in suitable cases with suitable individuals who choose themselves, the use of restorative justice will be entirely compatible with ECHR and various other international justice standards. So what are victims? What is the problem in securing restorative justice processes for them as a matter of right? A problem that seemed to... Uh, feed into the amendment in the legislation as well. Well, unlike many log jams, the, the blame for this cannot be laid at the door of human rights for the reasons I think that, that will be apparent from what I've just said. The, the value of restorative justice is a matter of international recognition. When asked, there are few who would express outright opposition to restorative justice, at least publicly albeit some hefty qualifications may be attached, many qualifications which simply reflect what is contained in international uh, uh, treaties and material. It might work in South Africa, or it might work with children, but it couldn't work with adults, and it couldn't work in the mainstream. For a system which likes to try 
and make advances based on evidence. That sort of approach, which is not spoken but is apparent, is disappointing. On the evidence, I would suggest that we could have already attempted to pilot restorative justice much more widely, including with more serious crimes. We could have looked at using it throughout the system and not just as at the, uh, the moment, primarily in uh, the youth justice system. My suspicion, or one of my suspicions, is that people are frightened of getting it wrong. We make assumptions, we all make assumptions about people and about groups, but we make assumptions about victims which get in the way of some of them being able to participate in restorative justice because sometimes we say, well, they wouldn't want to do that or they wouldn't want to do that in relation to particular sorts of crime. Well, how about this for an idea? Why not ask them? From recent meetings, I understand that victim support in Scotland are wary of mentioning the sort of justice, and this is for entirely understandable reasons, because they cannot always be certain that restorative justice services will be available in their area, or in the area where the, the witnesses or the victims are. So perhaps better to make no mention than to raise hopes of a, a restorative meeting which simply cannot be facilitated. It is also true that restorative justice is not a priority for victims' groups, and I don't say that as a, a necessary criticism, but it's simply a matter of fact. It is understandable, but the absence of restorative justice from high up the agenda of Victim Support Scotland, for example, it means that restorative justice is often ignored. Uh, there isn't really a group that speaks for offenders, and if there was, I'm not sure that restorative justice would necessarily be high up their list either. So very often the, the demand is unknown and the, the concept of the demand comes from practitioners such as people who are here in this room. So we carry on for the most part in just doing the same thing over and over in the formal justice system. By contrast, in England, there are strong supportive messages about restorative justice on the victim support website. No doubt this support has been informed by its experience in providing restorative justice services with government funding. Should we in Scotland be looking at something similar? I have little doubt that some who go through the regular justice system will find some satisfaction in their experience. I, I say only some. Some accused who are acquitted may feel that their innocence has been vindicated, uh, albeit that acquittal usually says more about the application of the actual test, which is whether their guilt has been proved. Um, some victims may feel that giving evidence gives them their day in court, and any subsequent conviction following on them, having given their evidence, was an, an essential stage in their attempts to put the crime behind them. They may see conviction as demonstrating that they were believed and accepted as reliable reporters of their experience as victims. Sentencing may or may not see victims feel further recognized and supported in dealing with their experience. But many people come through the system, whether as victims, witnesses, or accused, or social workers, or lawyers, or even sheriffs and judges, or justices of the peace, and are left feeling pretty unsatisfied at times. I can give examples, but I'm sure you could come up with more. I'll give one. Sometimes in court, the defense lawyer offers a public apology from the offender to the victim and their family. I have done so on some occasions when that has been a specific part of my instructions, although I confess uh, that in recent years where it's something that's come up, I've tended to counsel against it. Because I understand that when such apologies are offered in court or reported in the media, the reaction from victims and from others may well be an apology offered in this way is of no value in terms of demonstrating remorse. It's very public nature and its timing just prior to sentence it usually can work against it. The fact that it is, it is prayed in aid and mitigation um, can also undermine it. 
Many victims would like an apology, not the sort of apology I've just mentioned, but a proper apology, and that needs to be more than just a throwaway line in a plea in mitigation. Sometimes a personal letter can help, although for obvious reasons, sometimes a, a letter or any sort of contact from an offender is the last thing that a victim wants. But sometimes it can help. Sometimes it can make a difference if, uh, if it's handled properly. But our own experience of life surely tells us that the most convincing apologies are those which are delivered face to face. Think about it. Have you ever been convinced about an apology other than one that was delivered to you by someone that was standing in front of you? Despite that and other facets of restorative justice, its use in our system is extremely patchy. Uh, a, a recent mapping exercise in which some here were involved confirmed what we suspected about prevalence and good practices. In summary, its use is pretty isolated in the adult justice system. There was a seminar organized by the Scottish Consortium of Crime and Criminal Justice at which the, the DVD uh, of the film The Ripple Effect was shown, a film produced by South West Scotland Community Justice Authority in 2012, and I think there's someone from that authority here tonight, a film which features 10 victims of crime speaking movingly about their experience, and the film has been used as a catalyst and is explicitly used as a catalyst on their website for restorative uh, practices. Of course, there are many in Scotland who are involved in providing restorative justice in some way or other, and there are stout advocates uh, as well. It, it may be that all the stout advocates are, in fact, here in this, this room. I should, of course, mention SACRO. Uh, as a matter of my impression, SACRO are leaders in the field in Scotland when it comes to restorative justice and restorative practices. There are others involved, but SACRO seem to have been involved for the longest period of time, and, and whenever I have seen any discussion of restorative justice, not even just in Scotland, recent conference in Northern Ireland and, and conferences elsewhere, then SACRO are usually mentioned. Uh, and I've seen some of the tweets from the, the conference in, in Northern Ireland as well on the use, as I recall, of restorative justice in relation to more serious crimes, or at least that was part of the the conference. Uh, and I, I'm absolutely sure that uh, Derek McClintock would welcome SACRO's continuing involvement uh, in uh, restorative justice and in, in trying to um, push it up the agenda. There's also the Scottish Centre for Crime and Justice Research, the Centre for Youth and Criminal Justice, the Restorative Justice Council, there's the European Restorative Justice Forum, and I think Mal Kearney was the president or chair of that, but there is now also, and I actually only found this out this evening because it doesn't have a website, a Scottish Restorative Justice Forum for information in which you should speak to Mary Munro. Um, now, I understand that uh, they will have a, a new chair uh, who uh, is, is Professor Joanna Cha Chaplin, is that right, Mary? Yes, uh, who was involved in the research into restorative justice in, in England. Uh, and uh, that should assist at this particular time in giving restorative justice a further push. There is, I think, to be a hashtag which some people who are tweeting from this evening may use, which is a hashtag RJ in Scotland. Is that right? Um, so uh, for those of you who are on Twitter, um, if you want to tweet from this evening, if you could use that, and if you're looking for anything about this evening, uh, then hopefully that will, uh, will help you find it. Um, there is Mary Monroe herself, um, whose name features in much of the... Uh, Mary's just covering her face at the moment, and she's sitting towards the back, but anyone here who knows about restorative justice would not need me to say uh, how big a part the Mary plays in it. Um, there has been work by SACRO with survivors of childhood abuse at Quarriers Homes in restorative justice. Now, some of this type of work can be linked to the use of restorative practices in, for example, Truth and Reconciliation Commissions in places like South Africa and closer to home in Northern Ireland. It seems that in countries like that, there is a greater cultural acceptance of restorative practices 
whether as a result of some of these practices tying into very long-standing traditional methods of dispute resolution in the country, or due to restorative justice being used to deal with more recent community trauma and where people are extremely skeptical at the start of the process, but by the end of it, it's being used by ordinary people and, and not just uh, a, a small number. There is restorative justice in schools and residential child care settings, and there are standards for these. There has even been some research in Scotland, although uh, not on the scale uh, of England. In England, it was a seven-year research programme, £7 million, looking at restorative justice. So it, it uh, easily ticked the boxes in relation to international standards for knowing what you're doing, making sure that there's research to back up the best practices. And uh, Professor Chaplin found that in randomised control uh, trials of restorative justice with serious offences, so that was robbery, burglary and violent offences, by adult offenders, the majority of victims chose to participate in face-to-face -face meetings with the offender when offered by a trained facilitator. 85% of victims who took part were satisfied with the process. So that's adult victims and serious offences. And restorative justice re reduced the frequency of reoffending, leading to £8 savings for every £1 spent on restorative justice. Now, as to why someone from the Howard League is talking about restorative justice, that's uh, a strong uh, clue there. But it's difficult to think that there would be any other part of the system that would see victims expressing, 85% of victims expressing satisfaction with the process. Um, it was found that the frequency of reoffending was 27% less crime, 27% fewer victims following restorative justice. So something in it for, for everyone. Um, the, the government did some work of their own and showed that the frequency of reoffending was, was down by about 14%, but it still showed a considerable drop. And the strong evidence of an impact on reoffending is backed up by what we know from Northern Ireland where youth conferencing forms the main approach to all youth crime uh, as well as by international research evidence and so some of the figures are, are quite staggering and where you're talking about investing to try and save money uh, later on but having to find the money to spend now one of the figures that struck me was that the the cost of implementing a restorative justice scheme would be paid back in the first year and during the course of two parliaments, that's 10 years, society would benefit by over £1 billion. Uh, you can obviously do whatever you want with statistics, but that certainly was a, a decent argument for finding that money to invest now uh, for future uh, savings. Uh, but I suppose uh, with the way the UK government has been, then it may be that some politicians are not banking on uh, being around in 10 years. Um, there was also a report uh, released in July of this year by the Institute for Public Policy Research entitled Everyday Justice, Mobilising the Power of Victims, Communities and Public Services to Reduce Crime. They used the expression everyday justice. I, I think, it, I don't know whether it was maybe just an attempt to use a different expression because restorative justice has been used for so long that some people think they know what it is and some people think they don't like it. But using something else to try and get a different, uh, and, uh, different sense of it was, was perhaps what they had in mind. The report concluded that there should be greater use made of restorative justice and it said, crime harms victims and communities and the criminal justice system currently does too little to directly repair that damage. In fact, a lot of the time, that the criminal justice system wouldn't even really see that as part of its role. This report has shown that we can both improve public confidence and reduce reoffending by putting victims and communities at the heart of the system, while at the same time delivering a more holistic approach to how we manage offenders in the community. It is time to mobilize the collective power of all relevant actors and institutions both inside and outside the formal justice system to achieve reparation for harm done and rehabilitation for offenders. Now, there are numerous examples available of each, of, sorry, of such collective power in action. And I'll, I'll give only one. I wondered whether I should start with specific examples, but there are very good examples 
on some of the websites, and it's not entirely clear always how appropriate it would be to borrow some of them. Um, but the first one, I think it's clear enough that it's, it's all right to use it. And it's a, a Scottish example. In fact, it's an Edinburgh example. Uh, there was a man who had been seriously assaulted by four young girls, and the case got quite a bit of media attention. Um, it seems to be reckoned to have been one of the first examples of restorative justice in practice. I think, although I didn't check it before I, I stood up, that Sacro were involved in it. Um, they were, I can see. Um, and I think, although I couldn't find his, his autobiography, that the late Sheriff Nigel Thompson may well have been the, the sheriff involved, um, who uh, Sheriff Thompson was a restorative justice practitioner really before it, it was something that was much discussed. Um, the person harmed had made it known to the court, and this, I suppose, was, was why it was unusual then, that, that he wished to meet the four girls and tell them the effects of their unprovoked assault upon him. There were three face-to-face -face meetings arranged, and that must have been uh, through Sacro. And two of the girls were sisters, so they actually attended the same meeting. The outcome of the meetings was an action plan that was settled upon by agreement. So the victim was instrumental in this. And in it, the girls agreed to attend a day's training at the brain injury clinic at Edinburgh's Astley uh, Ainsley Hospital. Uh, this gave them a comprehensive insight into the potential consequences of their offending behaviour, or at least the opportunity for such insight. And the victim was able to make his voice heard effectively. He asked for something that was very unusual. He was obviously quite a remarkable individual, but he asked for something that was unusual, and the, the request ended up in front of a sheriff who was prepared to do unusual things. But the outcome for that victim of crime included him regaining control in his daily affairs, that he felt back in control of things. Um, he was more confident, and he became an advocate for the process of restorative justice. Uh, and he, he acted as a surrogate victim in, a, an, in another case. But I remembered that case because of the publicity that was attached to it, largely because this was a victim who wanted to talk about what a positive experience he'd had out of what, what had started as a, an appalling experience. The court received a brief report on each of the face-to-face -face meetings, which was taken into account in sentencing, and the sheriff sentenced the girls to three years probation. Now, while mainstreaming such processes for serious crime may be too much too soon in the Scottish context, in particular given the patchy availability in the adult system, it is worth noting that the research suggests that outcomes for all, uh, especially victims of serious crimes, are often even better. And how long do you think that we can continue to ignore that? To end the sidelining of restorative justice, it is important to continue to build a coalition of willing stakeholders uh, that will push and advocate for greater provision of restorative justice. And Howard League Scotland wants to be part of that and has been part of discussions in recent years on restorative justice. That things have always been done in a particular way is on its own never a convincing reason to leave them as they are. The work of John Carnahan, who I'm not sure if John's here uh, this evening, but the work of John Carnahan and uh, the Violence Reduction Unit shows that it makes sense to challenge all preconceptions and prejudices. And indeed, uh, the Lord Justice Clark has uh, demonstrated that in the field of, of criminal procedure and evidence. Old is not always bad, but neither is new. The 2010 Derek McClintock lecture was delivered by the Cabinet Secretary for Justice, Mr. McCaskill. He said, although he was talking about community payback orders primarily, we need to do things differently at all levels. We cannot simply ask you to do more for less. If we carry on doing what we've always done in the way we've always done it, we won't get any change. Um, I, I intend absolutely no offence. It seems to be a paraphrase of the Einstein quote about insanity. But... The same thing applies, I suggest, in relation to restorative justice. In conclusion, I would like to refer back to some words from the Book of Esses in honour of Professor Derek McClintock. 
In the preface, the, the editors, Ezat Fata and Tony Peters, drew on then current thinking, so that's back to 1998, and expressed the belief that restorative justice is the way of the future, that it will become the dominant or even the sole way of doing justice in the 21st century. This ties in with the, the bold claim which I saw made when I was preparing for this evening that restorative justice has been the dominant model of criminal justice throughout human history for perhaps all of the world's peoples, but I, I, it seemed only to be one criminologist that thought that. Well, here we are some 16 years on from uh, what was said in the preface to the book in honor of Derek McClintock. I appreciate that his colleagues may have intended to refer more to England than to Scotland. But even so, what can we say about that hopeful prediction? Is restorative justice the sole way of doing things now? Is it the dominant way? Is it really a significant part of our justice system at all? It may feature in youth justice and children's hearings to some extent. Individuals in the system may use restorative practices or techniques, perhaps through training, perhaps even instinctively to some extent. But as a means of delivering not only justice, but healing as well, it has been sidelined for far too long in the mainstream. I suggest that restorative justice offers the best opportunity in at least some cases to put the victim at the heart of the justice system. In appropriately chosen cases, it can deliver speedy and effective outcomes for victims and offenders. It offers apologies. It can offer the answer to the question, why? Which is very often the question that haunts victims and their families. It can contribute to desistance. It has not been mainstreamed here, although it has in other countries. The results elsewhere are encouraging to the extent that discussion elsewhere is now about the use of restorative justice in relation to more serious crimes. There is a quote from a victim of a serious crime on the Restorative Justice Council website, and this is an English case. I left the meeting feeling on top of the world, and for me it was closure. I know not every victim would want to have a face-to-face -face meeting with the offender, but it should not be left to the victim to, uh, to have to ask for restorative justice. And this was the victim of a very serious crime. I sense that we may have missed an opportunity, or perhaps even several opportunities to date, when it comes to restorative justice, but I, I sense that it's not too late. As the predicted dominant or sole way of doing restorative justice, of doing justice, restorative justice had a lot to live up to. But recognition as best newcomer has to be turned into delivery, uh, or else it's easy to fall into the where are they now category. Elsewhere it has been delivering, and it has been delivering here when given the opportunity. So let's hope that the new section in the 2014 Act and an expanded coalition of the willing, which is shaping up, see us move from apathy or lukewarm approval to rediscovery of the evidence, to increased use in Scotland, thus generating more evidence, and a reinvigoration of the whole notion of restorative justice. Thank you.